Getting back to the Voices of the Western Slope series, I am really, really excited for our uh, speaker tonight and the subject matter. I love how this ties in with Voices of the Western Slope because the desert dwellers that um, Craig is going to be talking about tonight, um, even though we aren't going to get to hear their voices, we will get to see sort of the visual um, echoes of their existence here. And, um, and uh, I also just want to say something I love about um, Craig's books is that we're reading them, we're listening to them. He goes places and faces challenges and brings back um, knowledge and I think wisdom um, you know, from the environment that we live in. It, and, and often in ways that I'm glad it's him doing it <laughs> and I just get to read about it <laughs> and I'm, I'm uh, glad that uh, Craig came away with his life from some of these adventures anyway so without further ado let's give a big warm welcome to Craig Childs <laughs> coming in on a day that we should be out. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's good to have a place indoors, but uh, you know that it's all really happening out there, right? Here, I'm just a facsimile of that, of, of what is out there, of, of the landscape, the mesas, the canyons. I'm, I, I live vicariously through myself. <laughs> I, I look back at the stories and I rewrite them. I guess writing is an act of, of living vicariously, even if it's, if it's what you did yourself. You're looking back through those experiences and then putting them into words. And, uh, uh, but where it's, where it's really happening is outside these doors, is, is out on the ground where you can hear your steps and you can sense the change of light how the wind moves, how the shadows of the clouds run over the ground. Um, we have to come inside on occasion. So I thank you for being in here. And thank you uh, to uh, Grand Mesa Arts and to the library. Uh, I think I, I probably five or six books, my first books were all written in either laundromats or libraries. <laughs> uh, I, that's, that's the mainstay for, for my writing is, is when I end up in a in a town or a city or anywhere, any civilized place, and I've got a moment of time, I go find the library. And I sit down there and I write. It helps to write when you're surrounded by books, when you're surrounded by, by so many people's stories. And, and you know, as a writer, what that means. You see each book and you go, oh wow, that was somebody's heart torn open and blood just poured over the pages. And then you look at all those books. So that's, that's inspiring for me. Uh, bef before we get serious about this, I want to do a little something. I want you to, uh, to try to forget that you're inside of a building. And this is a, it's a nice one. It's nice to have a theater like this. nice to have a stage. But get rid of the stage. Imagine that you're in a sandstone canyon, let's say, uh, a place that is deep and hollowed out. Flash floods down in the bottom have worn it into, into these shapes of shells and, and flutes. And, and every sound echoes. When you hear a breeze, it bounces from wall to wall. And you can hear the sound down in the bottom. So for a moment, let's not be in here. Let's be out in the canyon.
Thank you. I, I carry this, it's a Japanese shakuhachi flute, and I, I carry it around with me in the, in the backcountry, um, partly because it's lighter than a trombone, and I, that's, that's what I used to play. And, and also because it's just, it's hearing the, uh, the echoes, you, you can you triangulate, you can, you can hear places that you can't see. Uh, the, the sound wraps around up inside of alcoves, and, and so you're, you're down in the bottom of a canyon playing, and then you listen to the echo, and you, and you can hear the, the topography up there. So that's, the, that's one of the flutes that I, that I carry around. Um, uh, happy Father's Day. I, for, for all the fathers out there. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, one of the most uh, wonderful, challenging, painful, incredible tasks that I know of, uh, I suppose, um, second only to motherhood, maybe. Uh, but that's, this, is, this is not your day. <laughs> this is this is this is Father's Day, and and um, you know, on the subject of desert dwellers, I should bring up my father uh, because I I think desert dwellers, we we are desert dwellers. Uh, we live in in a dry landscape where people have been living for for thousands of years. Uh, people have been living since the end of the Ice Age. Uh, they lived here before the Ice Age before the desert was established like it is now, but generations going back. Mine, my generations are very few going back in the desert. My, my father was born in, uh, in southern New Mexico in the mysterious town of Roswell. <laughs> and and uh, that, that, is, that is my family from, from southern New Mexico, from, uh, from west Texas. My, my great-grandfather, taught range management in the Big Bend Desert of West Texas out of uh, Sol Ross, what's now Sol Ross University. And, and uh, my, my family line comes out of that, that part of the world, the high windswept Chihuahuan Desert, where I guess I'm from, I'm from the Motorhead clan. Uh, my, my, my one of my father's grandfathers sold used cars in Roswell, and my grandfather ran the Roswell Body Shop, and and uh, and that's that's where my my lineage comes from. But I think about my lineage coming from a place, coming from a landscape. Uh, my my parents moved to to Phoenix, and and I was born in Tempe, Arizona, and you could say that doesn't really make you a desert dweller if you live in Phoenix, but you're still, you're in it. You can see it. You can taste the desert from there. Even when it rains in Phoenix, you can smell the creosote out in the Sonoran Desert, the bushes that have that vibrant scent whenever the rain falls. And my father lived on the north end of Phoenix uh, before the city got there, so he lived out in the desert, and we watched the glow year by year moving north toward him and watched the developments move in. I remember the, the signs along the highways, the, the uh, just road signs spray-painted, save our desert. And now, wherever that was, is, is 20 miles into the city as we have moved out there into the land of Saguaros and all those beautiful buttes that now are, are, are hugged by strip malls and, and car dealerships. And, and I remember being with my father looking out of his backyard, out into the Saguaros, and, and, and you could see the glow of Phoenix coming. And he would tell me that sometimes, I don't know if this is real or not, I don't know if you really saw this, but he, he told me that sometimes he could see these electric blue dancers out in the desert. And his descriptions of them were the same, same dancers that you see on the Ho'okam pottery from, from a thousand years ago, from the Phoenix Basin. And he told me sometimes he could see them out there. And I don't know if he really could or not, or maybe that's just what you see when you look into the desert. You see the dancers who've been there for so long, the stories that have been playing out in the ground, so many stories in the earth there. Where I was born in Tempe, uh, the, 
the landscape is mounded with, with archaeology. And of course, the, the subdivisions go over it. There are neighborhoods and corner markets and hospitals and the, and the university, ASU, sitting right on top of it. But underneath is where the history is. I remember going to an excavation that was right, it was on campus, a, uh, a, a parking lot was being pulled up for a, for a future development, and, and they found, I think, 40-some graves underneath the parking lot from Holocom origins, so, uh, so probably about uh, 1300 AD. And right underneath the path for Sky Harbor Airport. So they're, they're digging, surrounded by traffic and buildings, and they're, they're finding skeletons that have, have pots all around their heads, ceramic vessels around their heads, and, and their, their forearm bones are, are, are covered with these, these shell bracelets that, that were walked up from the Sea of Cortez into the Phoenix area. And as, as I was watching them dig them up, I just, I just thought, wow, we've been, we've been parking here for a long time. <laughs> did, did anybody think about this? Did anybody walk from their car to, to wherever they were going thinking, there are bodies underneath me right here. There are memories. There are rooms and chambers. There are grinding, grinding stones for, for corn. There, the ground has so much history in it. And I, I remember talking to the, the archaeologists on this project, and they were, they were pulling everything out for repatriation, and, and it was returning to the tribes. Um, but my question was, why not just dig a hole deeper and put them down farther and build on top of it rather than take this layer away? Why not leave ancestry here in the ground? Which I know that it's, a, it's an unanswerable question because uh, there's, there's a lot involved here, but think, why, why do we erase the history from a place? Because I want to walk across a parking lot and think, there are skeletons underneath me. There are so many memories and stories in the ground. I was talking to, uh, to the woman who, would, who uh, digs up the, the whenever they find a, um, a grave, a human burial, that was her job. She was then assigned to that, and they said, she's our specialist, she, she does all the, all the bodies, and I, and I said, so why, what's your background, why, do you, why are you doing the, the, the skeletons, and, and she was sitting on the tailgate of a truck, smoking a cigarette, talking to me, and, and she was starting to get cagey, she didn't really want to talk about it, she said, it wasn't, a, it wasn't an academic specialty, it was just what, what they did, and the dig boss kept saying, you can tell them, tell them why you do this job, and I was, of course, as a writer, I was going, oh, there's something doesn't want to tell me, so I'm going to, I'm going to press on it, and I kept, I kept going, well, you don't have to tell me, but I am curious, why, <laughs> what is it about you, that, that why are they giving you this job, and, and finally she, I remember she was, she was smoking her cigarette, and she just took her cigarette out, and she said, because I cry the whole time, and then she put out her cigarette and stopped talking to me, and I, I thought, oh, that was, that's the best answer. It wasn't anything academic or scientific. It was that they, they said, she knows how to handle this. She is the one who needs to be with these remains. And, and you know, she had told me about a, a mother buried next to her fetus and, and how they were together and, and described it to me in, in detail. And I could understand. I think we look at the past and we, we think that it's, beyond us, it's not human, it's something, you know, something emotionless from long ago, and we forget that, that oh, all these people who lived here were people like us, the same kinds of people with hands, the same kind of people who celebrated their own versions of Father's Day, who had families, who had, had lovers, who had friends, and who wept when they buried people. That's what I think about when I'm out there when I see objects on the ground, when I see a posture, an arrowhead, I think, oh, love, pain. I think these were, these were actual people like us. So I wanna take you out there. Um, I wanna go on a, a bit of a, a journey this evening and, and, uh, 
and look at some of these sites. Look at look at what it's like to be a desert dweller because you know we're we're just a thin skim on history right now, learning how to live in the desert because. Many of us came from non-desert landscapes. Our families came from Norway, from, from, uh, from Great Britain, from places where it's green and rains, uh, and, and uh, places where you don't celebrate the same way when it rains. And before us, so many people lived in this desert, and, and how did it affect them? How did it change the way they see the world? I think landscapes make you who you are. I think living under Grand Mesa has to do something to you. Knowing that that thing is towering over you, that has to have an effect on your life. The way that the horizon is shaped, shapes you. And so how did it shape people a thousand years ago? I, I look at these, these signs and symbols and, and, and I, I'm always looking at how they fit into the landscape. This is a spiral up on the, the head of a, uh, a butte in, uh, in northern Arizona, far northern Arizona. And, and uh, spirals are all over the southwest. A uh, major, major theme out here. And, and um, I, could, I could do a whole, I could talk for the next two hours on spirals. And, and what they possibly mean, but especially how much, they, how important they are, how they show up in so many different cultural aspects. And, and often they have some kind of uh, alignment feature. Uh, if you stick around and watch it for long enough, if you watch this every day of the year, you'll see all kinds of different treatments of the, the equinox uh, sunrise uh, cuts this right in half. And I, I don't remember what solstice sunrise does, but this is a particular sunrise that happens in May and July. And I was here a couple of years ago in, in May, uh, up, on, up on top looking out, looking to the north, where you're looking out into the Colorado Plateau Desert, up to the Four Corners. The, and this place was, if you had come here a thousand years ago, there would have been people all over it, Pueblos, the Pueblo sites on, on every one of these high points and down in the basins below, thousands upon thousands of people living in a place where I'd say that there are probably, I don't know, nobody. <laughs> <laughs> if you go far enough out, there's still remnants of what was here of this larger civilization. The, the Hopi mesas are, are out there in the distance. So the, the Hopi Pueblos and towns, villages are are. are Consolidated over over here, um, a remnant of, of what was here before, a, a vibrant remnant. But compared to if you had been here a thousand years ago, at night there would have been fires all over, pueblos lit up. And I went there at sunrise uh, with with my kid and and uh, some some other. Folks and, and watch the sun come up on this, this mesa top, and the first light that hits the, the very top comes, uh, comes through a, a crack in the rock, and that light lands here next to this spiral, and then it starts to move. It moves across the face. And then it lands right in the center. And the tip of this, this wedge of light is exactly the size of the circle in the middle of the spiral. And this is, it's not a, it's not a known, known site really. There were, I think, six of us there and we all knew each other. So it's, it's just a happenstance out there, but not a happenstance, something that was it was planned, something that uh, this is sitting above a, the ruins of a, of a Pueblo that, that had hundreds and hundreds of rooms down, down below it. And, and this could mean a lot of things. It could mean this is the center place. This is where we have traveled for, for centuries and arrived at this place, very much part of the, the Hopi ancestry, Pueblo ancestry is, is, a, is a 
arriving at a center place. The spiral is a migration moving always around some center that you're arriving at, but then it's a spiral, so the center keeps going. You never, you, you arrive somewhere, but then, you know, a, a thousand years later, the center is over in Hopi. So for that moment, when this was made, this was the center. Of course, that's one interpretation. <laughs> and these spirals show up all over the place. See, this is, uh, this is in Tempe, uh, right in the heart of Tempe, you can see Camelback Mountain and Paestoa and, uh, and the, the Papago Buttes over, over here. And, uh, and you know, you're right in the middle of the roaring city and, and you're, you're finding petroglyphs looking down over it. And so it's this reminder that people have lived in this desert for a long, long time. People have known this place, have known how the seasons pass. People have known this landscape inside and out. You wander around these places and you, you can't, once you get the eye, you can't help but find signs, architecture, a granary tucked up in a, in a uh, canyon. This is a granary that I um, ran into last week. I was just out bumming around in a canyon uh, in, in southwest Colorado and and we, we got down to a part in the canyon where, where the cottonwoods were particularly lush and the, the ground was a little moist. So it, you know, it's just like, oh, there's something happens here with water. I'm going to head up into the, up into the cliffs and, and right up out of the floor, there was, there was a granary there with a beautiful uh, stone lentil entryway, uh, kind of rare. They, they don't often have these, these, these perfect stones. Uh, so just a a beautiful spot to come across and you're seeing fingerprints in the mortar. And of course, they're like yours. <laughs> they're like ours. They are, they, they were no different. And that was a piece of pottery near it, uh, probably a McElmo black and white or Mesa Verde black and white. Signs of, of people who I, I feel like they match the landscape with their artistry, lines, stark lines. And then later that day, looking for shade, you get under a boulder and there's a piece of rock art there. There's an image, this is probably a basket maker, so this is probably 2,000 years old. And this is making me thirsty. <laughs> When you look at the rock art, you, you see, you know, you, you, you look for, for patterns, you look for uh, the, the one raised hand, the one lowered hand, okay? That's something that I see uh, from canyon to canyon, and, and I see it grouped. I go, okay, they're, they're the raised hands over here, and over here, and over here. So what is the connection between these? You, you start to see the connected aspect of, of, of rock art, how what motifs show up in what regions and then how it changes from place to place. You see this, this, this hand ra raised up, the, the left hand up, the, the right hand down, and, and, then, and, and then other motifs, like, like a figure sitting on the shoulder, a little figure. I, I've seen that in so many places, and it goes back thousands of years. This is, this is probably 1,500-year-old imagery here. But then you can find 3,000, 4,000 year old imagery of, of a figure holding out its arm and there's a little human-like figure crouched on the arm. And, and as you start to, to gather stories, you look through old ethnography, you talk to uh, somebody like Carol Patterson, um, a researcher, a uh, scholar uh, out of Bluff, Utah, and, and she, said, she said, oh, did you look at the hands? These are these are bare images. That's, and, the, and I went, oh yeah, I hadn't noticed that that's actually, that's what you often see with a bear paw, the, uh, the line and then the, uh, the accentuated claws or fingers. And, and she said, you know, you've been calling this a person for so long and it's not. It's, 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 got, it's got bear relationship. And, and, uh, and, and, she, and her 
gathering information from somebody like her, you hear these stories where she's saying, oh, this, this figure on the shoulder, which I've been seeing for decades and wondering what it is, you know, she turns me over to some uh, Zuni knowledge about, uh, um, about a, a character, there's a little spirit who sits on the shoulder of the clouds. And, and uh, you have to be careful not to, dis not to scare this, this figure or it won't rain. But it's the one who's in charge of the rain and it's very shy and it sits on the shoulder of clouds. And, and, and then I, you know, I go to, to someone as Zuni, uh, a weaver who, uh, who weaves uh, the, the rain belts, the white sashes for the dances. And, and we talk about this, and he says, oh yeah, you can't, don't be loud when the clouds are coming. Be very quiet, because you'll scare them. And, and, I, and I've kind of, when we first were talking about this, it was the summer of 2020, and I couldn't get into Zuni, um, because everything, I couldn't leave the county. Um, everything was locked down, and, uh, and so we ended up having a lot of phone calls back and forth that summer. And I don't know if you remember the summer of 2020, but it was all fire smoke and hot as hell and not raining and and uh, and I would I would call him and he would say how's how's the rain coming up there and I would say it's not raining at all but I'm you know I'm out banging on things and he goes no don't bang on things <laughs> no you got to be quiet when the rain comes then when the rain comes you can start banging on things then when the thunder sounds you can start making noise so you know I, I think it's important to go back to the old stories of living in the desert. Who has been here longest? Go talk to somebody from Zuni and, and say, well, here's my experience with rain. What is yours? And he tells me his stories. And I tell him mine. And we weave them together. And that's how we live in the desert. His stories about rain are, be very quiet until it comes. And then when it starts raining hard, then you can start shouting. Then you can start banging a drum. And then when the rain stops and the thunder moves on, then you get quieter and quieter. And as he told me that, I realized, oh, that's how you live in the desert. You don't demand the rain comes. You respond to it. You listen to it. You have a relationship with it. But you don't demand. So I, I, look, for, I look for patterns. I look for... Um, uh, like this is a uh, a procession, and this this panel uh, is is uh, out near near where I live, uh, farther southwest of here. And, and I I just ran into it one day walking walking up in the in the cliffs, and I was really surprised to see it because this is a procession panel. So it's it's people carrying something either on their backs or their fronts, all in lines. And and it's important to get perspective on it. This is it's on the side of a boulder. Um, I, it's, whenever you see rock art, it's important to look around, at least for me. See where you are. What is the shape of the, of the landscape around you and see how this fits into it. All these figures in a line walking with, with some object and you go about 300 feet up that slope and there are more of them up, up high. You know, rough little figures, but I know what they are. They're all processions and, and they look like those uh, found, let's see, this is about a hundred miles west of there. Figures all walking, carrying something on their backs. And then in another location, in Utah, more figures walking with something on their backs. So this is some, I, I don't necessarily have to know what this story is, but I know a story is being told. That these aren't just decorations on, on a rock. That these are, these are actual, this, this is something happening. This is something being conveyed from place to place. You see these, these processions. And uh, this is Cody Chamberlain, a, a, an artist from, from, uh, from Utah. And he's got a painting here that he did of, of the procession panel, which is the, the big panel of processions in Utah. And, and I just, I like this picture because he's got the, the painting of the procession panel, which is up there. In that little, there's a draw and then a canyon that, that drops back in. So, so he's brought his painting out to a, a place that it has a relationship with that place. I, I think a lot about our relationships with places and objects, rock art, how they, 
how they relate to the, the landscape because it's, it's so easy just to take a picture and it doesn't have the rest of it with it. It doesn't have the wind and the sky and the, the place itself. This uh, procession panel, this is an archeologist from, from Pro Canyon down in uh, Cortez put together this, uh, found, I think it was 120, I don't remember how many figures, but 100 some figures marching. And, and you start to look at it closely and you realize, oh, these are different groups. They have different, they have different headdresses or different material with them. And, and this is some story of, of people moving. These people are all going this way. These people are going this way. These people are coming this way, and they're all going to the center. And this is probably around 800 AD. So, I mean, you can extrapolate from this and try to figure out what it means, but again, it's, it was a long time ago. It's, it's hard to say. But what it really means is this is a thing that's happening. That this is, this is people moving across the desert. A story about arrival, about migration, who knows, but it is a, it is a story. And I went, I, I've taken many pictures of this, but I, I like where they, they emerge right here and, and uh, they come out of, out of a crack. And, and, uh, and you just get these little markings. And when I, I talked to uh, um, someone from, from Hopi, a, a scholar who lives down in the mesas, uh, and, and he was saying that, that oh, they're, they're very rough when they're coming out of that because they are just coming into being. And then they start gaining detail as they come into the world. And you look at something like this and, and, and go, okay, let's look at motifs. Let's look at well, who's this, this figure with a bird on, on the head and with a, with a crook neck staff. Well, let's, let's just take the crook neck staff. That's, a, that's a, a thing that shows up in rock art all over the place. Um, I've, I've found it in, in over, over hundreds, uh, probably over 500 mile area. Um, end to end, I've found these, these images of, of figures with, with these crook neck staffs. Um, there's, there's one there. Um, and, and, you know, what does it mean? Um, I'm not gonna get into that. <laughs> It's a, it's a long, complicated story, but it, it's just that, that it means something. Here's, here's one with a, you can see that kind of question mark on top, and, it's, and, and in these processions, you see certain figures that, that hold them. So, so I kind of, I, when I see these motifs, I just go off on them. I, I go, oh, I've seen that in all these, these other places, and I start to cross-reference them, and, and then I, my, my desk, starts to look like one of those crazy people with threads going across maps, going every which way. But there are all these connections, like the, the figure with the bird on its head. What is that about? And you start looking around and you go, oh, well, there are figures all over the place with birds on their heads. Um, and they're, they're ducks. I think there are some places where there are different kinds of birds, but most of them are ducks, and they're really focused on the, the Four Corners region. They're really heavy down in Canyon de Chez. They're up into southwest Colorado. And, and places where you see ducks on top of people's heads or ducks instead of their heads. And, and it, you know, in some ways I look at it and I, I go, isn't that funny? That's weird, ducks. Like, and I think of like Donald Duck, Daffy Duck, and that's not what they were seeing. <laughs> They weren't looking through De Disney's lens, lens uh, a thousand years ago. They were looking through the, a, a, a very different cultural lens where, where ducks meant something in particular. And as I, as I spent time talking to people from Zuni, I found that, that every Pueblo has a different primary bird. Uh, and Zuni is, is the duck. And, and uh, the ducks are the ones who travel between the upper world and the lower world. They're the divers. And there's a, there's a, a very significant story in Zuni, which, which uh, I've, I've 
heard it in, in many different ways, but just uh, a, a simple recap of it is that that uh, the the hero or the, the the mythical figure at the beginning of time had to go into the underworld, and to get down there, he had the duck as his his guide, and the duck led him down into the underworld. They had you know their their stories upon stories about what happens there, and then he came back out, and to honor the duck, he carried it on his shoulder or on top of his head. And so you you hear a story like this, and then you look back probably 1,500 years, and you see this, and you realize, oh, this has not broken. We look at rock art, and sometimes we think, oh, this is some mysterious past that's not connected. But then when you start spending time with people from Zuni and Hopi, from uh, Diné, uh, Ute, you, you realize, oh, these stories have not stopped. This isn't some indistinct past that's separated from us. This is, this is a connection to now. I went out to a, uh, a site at, um, this is actually, it's a, it's a Hopi site, but it's, it's on the, the Diné Nation, and uh, I went there with, with Micah Lomaomvaya, who was a, uh, a Bear Clan priest, and, and we, looked at, uh, we looked at the rock art on, on this boulder, and, and this boulder has, has, there must be a thousand figures on the boulder itself. It goes all the way around and onto the top, and, and there, there's, there are images up in these boulders all up, up beyond it, and you know, around it, there is nothing. There, there are just boulders, dry landscape, and then suddenly you come to this spot where there are thousands of, of petroglyphs. And, and if, if I came upon this just randomly out in the, out in the world, I would, I would go, okay, I have no idea why this spot. And that's the question I ask when I see an image on rock is, why here? What, what is it that made this happen in this one particular place? And, and he, he said, well, first of all, if you go up in, in the, at the base of this rim rock up here, there's a little spring. And so there's water here. And of course, wherever there's water, there's going to be something, some human relationship. Uh, but the bigger factor here is that he said that this is the, this is the route to the Grand Canyon for Zuni and Hopi for the, uh, for the salt pilgrimage, where they go down to a specific cave and gather salt and bring it back out. And this is where clan initiates, uh, would, the society initiates, would, would come and stop here for water and leave clan markings on, on the boulders. And, and so this was, this was my opportunity to find out, oh, there is a reason you know, that, that people are on a pilgrimage as they, as they come through here. Whereas most of, the, most of the time you come to a piece of rock art and you go, I don't know why it's here. It's out in the middle of nowhere. And there's some story that, that you don't know. And that I just happened to be at a place here with somebody who knows, who, who could say, oh, these are, we walked through and, and he, was, he was saying, these are specific clans and here are the names of the clans and, and there are some clans that no longer exist. They've been lost to time and here is the record of them or some are so recent that, that I, I remember him, him seeing one, one uh, image and going, oh, he's not a very good guy. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, you know you know the people. This is this is not just this is not some some past that's beyond you. You're still you're connected directly to this. That these images are are reflecting something that, that has not ended. He's the, he's uh, he's Bear Clan, and and here is here is Bear Clan on, on the boulder, and you can see different. Uh, you can see it changing over time. Here is. Here is different, a, a different era of the Bear Clan, and here is a different era. And so people have been stopping here for thousands of years and leaving their mark. And when we talked about the older stuff, going back to Basket Maker, he said, oh, that's, you know, that's past a thousand years ago. That's too far. I don't know. That's in that, that murky past. So it seems like human memory in, in precision is, is lasting about 800 to 1,000 years. What do you remember from a thousand years ago? 
know, that's, I think that's one thing that this desert does is it creates longevity. If you survive here, if you thrive here, you might last for a thousand years. Hopi ancestry probably goes back 13,000 years in the Southwest. There is indigenous ancestry that is just flooding this place. And we live here right on the surface, seeing these signs, seeing bits and pieces of, of, of people who pass through people who were on a migration following a spiral, a spiral that led to Hopi, Zuni, Akama, that led to the Rio Grande Pueblos. The Four Corners around 1275 AD is probably most of you know that, that most of the Pueblo people left the Four Corners and headed south. And you can follow the, the movement. You can follow, you can look at uh, the, the DNA of, of, uh, of turkeys that they were they had domesticated, and then look at where look at the DNA of turkeys now in the southwest, and and the turkeys from from the Mesa Verde region, from the cliff dwellings that there were they had domestic turkeys there, their genetic line goes directly to the Rio Grande. So the turkeys on the Rio Grande now are directly related to the turkeys who who were in Mesa Verde a thousand years ago, which to me and to to many archaeologists mean. They picked up their turkeys and migrated out of there and settled somewhere else. And so they carried those specific genetic lines to the Rio Grande and established pueblos there. So this, the, this so-called mysterious disappearance of the Anasazi, um, it's not really a disappearance at all. It's just a movement to another place. And if you, you I, I, I think about if you, if you put a square on the ground and you see some ruins, you would go, okay, they lived here for a time, but then they're gone. Just open that square up by about 500 miles and you'll find them over here. And that's what the ancestry of the Southwest has been. That's what desert, the desert does to you. It makes you a migrant. You, you, know, you may stay in a place for 100 years or 200 years, but the climate's gonna change. It doesn't take much to get dry and move you out. And you go, okay, well, we've got family relations over there. There's a river over there. We'll move to that place. So this is a landscape of mobility. It keeps people moving from place to place, which means you find what they left as they were, as they were going through. You find these remnants, these, these granaries and cliff dwellings. And some of them are, are large. Some of them have hundreds of rooms. And this one in, in particular, uh, it's, it's way out there. So it doesn't, have the, it doesn't have a trail leading to it. And as you walk around the bottom of it, you're finding pieces of, of, uh, of woven turkey feathers from blankets and so much pottery. And, and when I see that, I go, oh, this is all identity on the ground around me. I pick up a piece of pottery and I, to me it's, makes it very black and white, but to somebody who knows it, somebody from, from Hopi perhaps, they might see that and go, oh, this is, this is our clan. And I've been in meetings with, with, uh, between archaeologists and, and indigenous people and scholars where, where they're saying, uh, we, we found this site, uh, does anybody know about it? I remember being at a table at, a, uh, at the Grand Canyon and, and representatives from each tribe were at the table and, and an archaeologist put this out and said, here's a sign I'm wondering about, uh, a site, and, and everybody leaned back away from it except for one person who said, yeah, that's ours. And you could tell, they all knew. They all knew that this, who belongs to these places. So when we see them, we think of them as maybe ruins or abandoned or um, you know, something left behind, but it's actually part of a, a continuity. I think if you came back in a thousand years, there may be people living here. That this is part of an ancestral map. That these places are remembered and returned to. And there are shrines out here that have, have pottery, uh, classic Hopi yellowware that's probably 200 or 300 years old. Meaning people are walking up from Hopi and leaving pieces of pottery here and walking back. The connections haven't ended to these places. And when you enter them, you feel that. 
you know these places are not dead. They are still alive. They're still part of a cultural memory. And when you move through them, you listen, you smell, you take in every sense. Because a place that's still alive still has a beating heart. It hasn't been forgotten. I was here at this site with, with somebody from uh, the Snake Clan in Hopi. And we walked down from here to the, the San Juan River and stood in the river and he told a story about his ancestors in this place. And he said, that, yes, look at the rock art. These are snake land sites. This is my family. Which is very different from seeing it in, seeing it in a national park and uh, you know, where it's, it's not necessarily family. It's some ancient thing. But you realize this is somebody's family. This is some connection. I find things out there. I find, I, this is, you can tell, I'm, I was old. Oh, I'm old now. <laughs> that a long time ago, I was, I was out roaming around, and, and, uh, and I looked up in this space here. I just stuck my head in this crack to see what was in there for, I don't know why I do that. And back inside was this basket, uh, probably about 1,500 years old, and a coil weave, uh, basket maker style basket that somebody had, had slid back in there and turned it upside down so it wouldn't collect dust. And as far as I know, it's still there. And you see that, and you can see the hands that work the weave. And it wasn't that long ago. 1,500 years, somebody stashed this. And I think maybe they'll come back. Maybe some clan line remembers this place. And maybe maybe 700 years from now, or maybe, maybe next year, somebody will come to this place and go, oh yeah, my family, my, my family's basket. I like to think that these memories last that strongly. This was another, this was a vessel that... Uh, that I found um, uh, in Utah, and it had two uh, it had a crack here on this side, and two drill holes on either side, and it was tied together. The drill holes were tied together with a with a piece of yucca twine to keep the crack from spreading. And and uh, this this pot we left it there, but uh, the the cliff above it has since caved in and completely demolished the site, so that. That pot no longer exists. Uh, pot shirts will start coming out over the next few centuries from underneath the rock pile and start drifting downstream. But I, you know, there's there's something powerful about running into something like this in the desert. These things remain. You know, that thing will. If, if the cliff hadn't fallen, that thing, or at least it would eventually dissolve into pot shirts, but they would stay there for. You could come back and in 5,000 years, and it would still be there because the landscape protects these things. It's the, the desert curates these, these objects. And this was just in, in April. I was coming down a, uh, uh, a crack and, uh, and got down to the edge, down to a cliff, and it was kind of undercut on both sides, and I dropped to my knees to look down underneath, and there was this corrugated jar sitting there. And this is a friend who was with me. Actually, he's been with me for, for the last, he, he, was, he was about three feet away from me when, when I found that basket. He was about uh, two feet away from me when I found that red seat jar. And he was probably about 15 feet away from me when I found this. So I think he's the one who's just, he's kind of pushing me into place and going, Look at that zone there, because he knows I'll stick my head into the cracks. <laughs> and you find this uh, probably 900,000-year-old uh, corrugated piece of pottery where it's, it's a pinch pot, and there are, there are fingerprints on the, on the little pinches, so you can see the, the potter's finger. And, and to give you a context, um, 
That's where it is. It's right there. It, for me, it's about context. How does it fit into the land? How do people fit into a place? The shape of the land, I think, changes who you are. It creates, you are responding to it. You are finding the places to, to paint, to sit. Uh, to, I, I find that whenever I sit down in the desert, I think, oh, why did I sit here? This, this must be a spot. I bet there's something here. Because we go back to the same places again and again. You get to a place and you look out from there. You find this, this beautiful pear. I, I think of this as a basket maker Kama Sutra. Uh, <laughs> two people interlocked. And, and to give you bigger context, there they are next to a, a birthing scene. And, and with, with, with an infant down here. And, and, uh, and there's all kinds of stuff on this, on this uh, rock face. But, but it, this is only part of the story. The other part of the story is where you turn around and look at where you are, and this is the view from that rock art site. That birthing scene looking out over the desert, a view like that. That is birth. <laughs> and I guess I, that's all the images I have. Um, I just, I wanted to give you a taste of what I experience out there and what I continue to experience. That, that, that is, that's a landscape that I feel like is, is burned into me. The, the shape of the desert, the thirst, the knowing where water is, is seeping out of cracks and, and knowing where there's going to be sign, where, where at the top of, of, of this, this mesa edge, there is, a, there is a birthing scene looking out all, across all of this. And why is it here? Well, there's a, there's a route that comes up from the bottom that gets you to this level. And then there's another route that comes up the cliff face below here. And, and this, is, this is one of the few places where you can pop out of the, out of the lower desert into the upper, upper echelons of this mesa. And so right at that route is this, is an image that must have been very, very important. And you start piecing these together and you start moving along them and you're moving in the ways that people have been moving for a thousand years. We live in a landscape of ancestry. We live in a landscape that's, that's filled with history that goes back so far. People who knew how to live in the desert, who know how to live in the desert, the clans that have not ended. And we here are just this skim right on top, this last current moment of history. We are the desert dwellers. We, and Sunni, and Diné, and Ute, and Hopi, and Akama, Paiute, so many cultures that have come out of this place. Walk out into the desert, look for water, sleep under the stars, make contact with these long, long ages because they've been going on so long and you can smell it when it rains. Thank you for coming and listening. I think we have time for, for a, a little Q&A. If, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to dive in. Yeah. Have you played your flute in Grand Staff? Have I played my flute where? Grand Staff. Um, Grand Staff. No, I don't think I have. Is that where I should go? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go play your flute there. OK. I've been talking about some uh, about acoustic landscapes with with archaeologists who, who've uh, and there's one out of Moab uh, who um, who's
was recommended, so maybe that's the spot, because he said there are certain places that have these acoustic qualities, and, and often acoustic qualities are, rock art has some acoustic, uh, especially the old stuff, the early hunter-gatherers, they're, they're really associated with, uh, you know, there are places where you can, I've played my flute at a site in, in Horseshoe Canyon in Utah, uh, near the Great Gallery, and, and had people sitting about half a mile away in another alcove, many bends away, but that's the next rock art. And so we were both at rock art sites and I played my flute and they could hear it just crystal clear where they were. And I, I stopped playing and I said, I said, could you hear that? And they said, yeah, <laughs> they were half a mile away. Where, where is this? Uh, I can't say, <laughs> I, I gotta be careful. Uh, but it's, it's in Utah. Uh, <laughs> And that's, uh, that is uh, the Monument Valley in the distance. Um, it'd be, uh, there's a lot of rim rock up there. <laughs> I'm not gonna answer any more questions. <laughs> yeah. say that about all cultures, that, that the youth are not necessarily interested in the old stories of, from any of our cultures, uh, which you probably could have said that uh, 50 years ago, too, um, that, that every, you could, every generation is probably looking back at the last one going, oh, you're losing so much, which is probably true. There's a, there's a lot being lost, but somehow it keeps continuing, and I and I feel like there's enough continuing going on that it's it's not going to be lost, but it sure is going to be changing. Like the the uh, the Bear Clan priest I went out with, he's forty, he's he's in his forties, and he is the youngest uh, priest, society priest, and there are no more priests after him. It's the the, the process has stopped, um, and and. Uh, I talked to him about this. I said, well, that's, you're the last. Uh, this, is, this is terrible. And he said, he was just kind of going, well, this is where we're going. We're, we're taking another path. But he's going to be, he brings his family out. He's out there with kids telling them these things so that they, they know, which I think we all have this. I think kids are not necessarily born interested in, in, in our past. Ways of, of telling them. I, I don't think it's lost, but I think it's, it's in peril. And I think there's a, a lot in peril right now, culturally, from a lot of cultures, indigenous cultures and, and non indigenous cultures. Um, but, but I also see in the, especially, well, in Pueblos, yeah, in like Hopi, Zuni, uh, really strong continuity that there are things that are being passed on. There are people who are picking this up and, and going. So it's probably always this, you're always losing a certain amount. And that's what I saw in those boulders with the clan images, that there are clans that no longer exist. That they, the, those stories ended somewhere. But the clans are still going. Other clans are still going. So I, I'm, I'm not hopeless about it, but I see that we're going through a bottleneck right now. And I think we're all going through that bottleneck. Yeah. Yeah. You talked about birds. Did they have any other kinds of animals? Did they have horses or cattle? Or no, sheep? not not those kind of not not the large domestic animals, but they had they had dogs, um, domestic dogs. But they've been domestic dogs have been around since the Ice Age in, in North America. Um, turkeys were the major domestic. They also had macaws, tropical macaws from Central America. Uh, that, that there were actually live macaws at, at, at Chaco in, in uh, New Mexico from a thousand years ago or so. So they did have they they had animals, um, but.
corn, uh, agriculture was, was the main thing, at least for, for the, the Pueblo core. As you got out farther, it's more hunter-gatherer. But when, you, when, you're, when you're looking at the agricultural world of, of Pueblo ancestry, it's, it's dogs and, and, uh, and turkeys and macaws. Macaws are rare, but, uh, but they were brought up alive. Mexico in particular. And birds are a major feature for, for the Pueblo world. Uh, so many bird artifacts. I, I went through the collection uh, at, at uh, the American Museum of Natural History in New York from Chaco uh, in New Mexico. And, and you'd open up a drawer and it'd just be full of bird pendants and effigies and another drawer, wooden bird figures. And, and so birds are a major, major feature in, in their world. And some of the Kiva paintings, the, the ceremonial room uh, murals, you can, you can say, oh, that's a magpie, and that's a golden eagle, and, and uh, that's a raven. You can see the, the individual birds and what species you're looking at. Uh, yeah, very important in, in the Pueblo world. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, at the shaman panel? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I, it's been a while since I've, I've, been, I've been on the Dolores. It's in the middle book, yeah. Uh, I, I guess I'm not familiar with it. I probably saw it once. There are a lot of hummingbirds. I see hummingbirds, uh, especially the old sites, uh, which there, is, there are a couple old hunter-gatherer sites along the Dolores. Uh, the the uh, the long draping red figures and uh, and you see hummingbirds at, at a lot of the early hunter gatherer sites hummingbirds flying around a figure's head um, so I don't know if it's one of those I don't know which clan uh, <laughs> yeah it's my knowledge is is a thin thin skin. They, once you start getting in, once you start talking to people about it, they start telling you things that you go, I'm not supposed to know this. And so I spend a lot of time erasing my memory from conversations because things, that are, things are said to me out of politeness. Uh, I remember interviewing a, a, a young dancer. He was probably 15 years old, a Hopi dancer. And, and he told me a lot, which he was young. He told me too much. And, and I wrote a piece and I sent it to his parents and his parents panicked and said, no, oh, no, this is ceremonial knowledge. Uh, this is not for public consumption. So I, I went through and just cut out all these pieces. Of, the right hand holds the, the corn pollen or the left hand or whatever it was, and the, the, the certain step was this was representative of this relationship with the clan, and, and this stuff is all really important knowledge that is not public. Uh, uh, so, so I actually know very little. <laughs> I just walk out there and look at these things and, and, uh, and go, this meant something. Well, all cultures change through time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And they've changed. I mean, they've been through, they're still in a bottleneck. They've been through, I mean, going through a genocide is going to change your culture. And, and so much has, has changed, but I still see... There's so many things that, you know, a culture that's lived through so much. When I talk to people from Hopi, they, when, I, when I say, well, what do you think about this you know, manifest destiny and what's been happening? And they, they go, ah, or some people. <laughs> and they're just kind of, yeah, we've seen, we've seen worse. Uh, yeah, and and we, we're still here, and we're going to outlive all this. And, and so things change, but some things are carried through, and those, those long, deep cultures like Hopi, uh, I think carry so much through from the past. Even if it's a thread, it's going to make it through. And so the culture will change, but these, these old connections remain intact. And that pilgrimage to the salt in the Grand Canyon still happens. So these things haven't ended. Well, thank you very much for coming tonight.